So without further ado, I want to introduce David Rowan. He's the editor of uh, Wired UK edition. I think it's uh, a publication that started over 22 years ago. It's been current and relevant for over 20 years, which is quite a feat in the uh, changing IT landscape. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hear what you have to say. Thank you. Karman, Ath, Shao, Ekur. The rest is going to be in English. Um, hello. So I edit a magazine about the future, and I spend a lot of time, probably 140 flights a year, traveling to meet the entrepreneurs and the venture capitalists and the scientists and technologists who are trying to solve the problems, find market opportunity, create new kind of businesses. Um, and what I'm going to do in the next hour is translate a lot of the things I'm saying into how relevant it is for finance. And I've tried to boil down some of the bigger trends into like the top 10. Um, but first, I want to talk a little about how we forecast the future, how you can tell what's going to catch on, what's going to change an in industry and what isn't. Um, it's often quite educational to look at history and how we forecast things in the past and what we got right and maybe what we got wrong. And I'm going to show you a little corporate video from 1967. A big American corporation, the Philco Ford Corporation, made a video about what it thought life would be like in 1999. So remember, this is 1967. And let me just show you an example of how they thought we would be shopping way ahead in 1999. I love this, it's 47 years old and it got it completely right, almost. So the form factor is more like this, but if you think about it, it's how we wanted to use it that they got right. It's simplifying your life, it's connecting to loved ones, it's expressing your identity, it's shopping, spending money, and it's that electronic correspondence machine. Um, and it's often useful not thinking about a technology that's come along. Um, it's more about, does this new device, does this new product get out of the way and let us become more human, let us become more emotionally connected to what we actually care about? Because Moore's law is going to change the form factor. There was a great line in the film The Graduate where Mr. Maguire says to Benjamin, I've just got one word for you, one word about career advice. Um, and it wouldn't be plastic if it was happening today. I think it would be mobile. Um, and the first of the big trends is how comprehensively the world is connecting on these small devices, not just the expensive ones, but the $25 ones that are now smartphones that are starting to come onto the market. So you remember in the 1950s, the American landscape changed because the motor car became affordable for the average family, and you suddenly had new architecture. The out-of-town shopping mall became a possibility. Um, this is much more significant and much more accelerated, and this is transforming all sorts of expenditure in an incredibly short space of time. It reaches more people. It forces every existing business to rethink how it's going to reach the customer. Um, if you think about the numbers, three times as many people get on the internet for the first time now every day using one of these than babies are being born. And there's even apps now to check how many times you're checking your apps on your phone. <laughs> it's like an addiction. Um, and it's behavior changing. And every single business must kind of address that. So this is a man I spent some time with last December in Mountain View. He came to America from communist Ukraine, age 16, as a refugee, lived on welfare, um, and was always frustrated that it was expensive for him to call his family back home in Kiev. And so as he did a couple of tech jobs, he worked at Yahoo, he kept thinking, how can I solve this problem? How can I remove this friction? So he invented an app. And you probably know where this story's going. Um, so WhatsApp, when I went to see them, they had 430 million monthly active users. By the beginning of February, it was half a billion. 
Facebook buys them in February for $19 billion. In the four years that they spent building up their half a billion active customers, how much did they spend in total on advertising plus marketing plus public relations? So it's a new kind of world where if you have a product that people love and that's simple, it will do its own marketing. Um, they're obsessed with simplicity. They kept refusing requests to add features. They just wanted the platform to have no clutter. The co-founder of this man, Jan Coombe, put a post-it note on his desk, which is still there years later. No ads, no games, no gimmicks. Um, and I think nobody wants complications in their life. They could have had a short-term financial return by putting ads in there, but we wouldn't have loved it. Although when the BBC reported the $19 billion purchase, it became easier to understand because they said it was an incredibly valuable massaging service, which <laughs> I, I accept that kind of valuation now. So think of payments and financial transactions. This is just PayPal's mobile payments. Look at that growth curve. It's come out of nowhere. This is Jack Dorsey's company, Square. Just look at the rising transaction volume since 2011 to this spring. This is not counting. They did a deal with Starbucks so that they're accepted in American Starbucks. Um, you know, even outside Europe and North America, all sorts of other extraordinary growth curves. So in Kenya, estimates vary, but about a third of the economy goes through this mobile transaction service, M-Pesa peer-to-peer -peer through people's standard phones. It doesn't have to be a smartphone. Um, so this is the proportion of people who use their phones for payment outside the West. In Kenya, almost 70% of people in South Africa in particular. And then a new device comes along. This is the last one, not the bendable one. Um, <laughs> and it has a new technology, and it can, kind of resets the game again. So the five came with something called iBeacon, which is Apple's way of using low-energy Bluetooth. Low-energy Bluetooth is a way of communicating 100, maybe more, meters away. And you can identify a device before someone's in the store when they're on the other side of the road. And you can have this conversation. So that creates a new kind of intimacy. Plus, Apple has this biometric touch ID. Plus, it's got your credit card number. So suddenly, Apple becomes maybe the most powerful potential payment service in the world. <coughs> Already, this low energy Bluetooth is being used in retail. This is a company called Estimote that has this blue cube on the wall of a shop that sends targeted offers to customers in the neighborhood. And PayPal's doing the same with PayPal Beacon. So you have this new, very granular relationship with the citizen, with the customer. And it changes their expectations very fast. And think of fast-growing companies, taxi service, Uber. It's all via the mobile device. Um, so this is the growth curve of a bunch of these taxi services. The green one is Halo. The blue one is Uber. The red one is Lyft, big in America. Any kind of business wants to be on that curve. If the, exa the existing transport companies don't move as quickly, they're going to be irrelevant. Same is happening in all sorts of other sectors. This is a growth curve for people ordering food in the US in their apps. So this is from a company called Grubhub, which did a, an IPO. So another big thing is when people are connected on this network, you kind of have to assume everybody is going to be pretty soon connected. Um, they don't necessarily need the existing financial institution. It's not always convenient for them. So can someone guess what these businesses have in common? Everything from a games company to a dating company to a travel booking company to news companies. Well, they all take payment in Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is still not officially recognized in many jurisdictions, but there's now you know, Bitcoin ATMs, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer currency. 
And these are, again, some growth curves showing the number of Bitcoin wallets people have. And there's not just one player, there's a whole bunch of them. And it's not necessarily going to be Bitcoin that wins. There's a whole bunch of other cryptocurrencies fighting for domination. But what we have learned is there is a real interest in people connecting in ways that allow them to pay without giving transactions to the banks, without waiting for the bank to allow them to access their money. And you know, if you're the security agencies, actually this is probably better news than people paying cash because inside Bitcoin, there's a record of all the other Bitcoin transactions and it is pretty traceable. And then the peer-to-peer -peer thing is happening in lending. So you need a loan, you don't now need to go to the bank, you can go to services like this, or Orchard, which is a, a newly heavily funded one with people from some of the big hedge funds. There's um, a big funding injection they just got this week. In the UK, Cedars is growing very quickly to help businesses, startups especially, raise their funding. You can go to AngelList, which is a platform connecting angel investors. So peer-to-peer -peer payments is on a rise. Again, this is M-Pesa, the top line. This is how much people are trading, transacting with each other each quarter since the launch. And then there's another one, the Benmo. And then if you don't like paying a stockbroker to advise you on stocks, you can go to a peer-to-peer -peer investment community. This is eToro, where how successful you are in your stock trades is public. There is a leaderboard. And you can follow the person who's got the best trades and invest in the same companies as them. Transparency is a great thing. Traditional financial institutions don't always like that. You can't really put it back. So what about making money for all sorts of things? So a couple of kids decide they want to make a potato salad. They go to Kickstarter. They say, um, we think we need $10 to make a potato salad. It's not going to be a good potato salad because we've, we've never made potato salad before. But if anybody wants to back us. And it became a bit of a joke. They got $40,000, 4,000 people <laughs> backed them. Um, and again, there is no barrier to entry. Anybody can put themselves up. It took a year, uh, it took 93 years for Hilton to get 650,000 rooms. It took four years for this network to get the same number of rooms and they don't have to change the sheets. And again, in every sector where you can connect people to bypass the incumbent, that's happening. So these barriers to entry, I think we need to think about all our businesses and what is protecting us? And it's, it's no longer enough to say, well, regulators or our marketing budget. Um, this is Mark Andreessen. He made the first popular web browser. And now he's one of the most successful investors in Silicon Valley. Um, and he's often worth listening to. He's making a big bet on Bitcoin. Um, and he's, he's talking about the financial industry. And let me just read that. Today, you wouldn't invent any of these financial businesses in the same way. The opportunity he sees is about unbundling the banks, taking apart all the services that they offer. Um, and the regulators are kind of not helping. If they're going to regulate the banks, then you'll have non-bank entities that spring up to do what the banks can't do. And investors like this love friction between what people want and what the institutions plus the regulators want. So, you know, think of something. Foreign currency transaction, peer-to-peer, -peer, and other innovative startups like TransferWise enable you to transfer money without going through the conventional banks, without giving them the same percentage. Typically, it's about half a percent through the mid-market rate with TransferWise. Um, German bank Fidor, they're modeling themselves on being the community's bank. There is a... Um, community forum, and they even employ about 10% of their staff by recruiting from the community. If you want to buy a sheep, you don't have to go to a sheep market. Now, you can go to Instagram. This is, um, th this is an Instagram page, a real page in Kuwait, where people who want to buy and sell cattle and sheep, 
they just list them here. And this is a real phone number. If you want to buy somebody a, a goat or a sheep for their birthday, this is the number to call. But again, barriers to entry. Nobody has said this is an authorized place to transact live animals. It just happens. It's happening in every sector in cosmetics. Michelle Fan sits in her bedroom talking about how to put on makeup, how to look like Angelina Jolie in this movie and so on. More than a billion views. She now launches her own makeup brand. Cosmetics companies have to go to her and pay her to talk about their products. She's an amateur. You know Wikipedia? Well, Wiki House. In the old days, you had to train for seven years to be an architect. Now you can go to Wiki House, improve, redesign plans that are there, available for everyone, then download them and build whatever you want. So manufacturing. So a couple of years before Apple and Samsung, this gentleman, Eric Migikowski, wanted to design a smartwatch. He wanted it to talk to his phone. He went on to Kickstarter, thought he'd need $100,000, raised $10.3 million from the crowd. His team is not an experienced manufacturing team, but they made a business. Now, who is the controller? Who controls the skies? So this is the Bangkok Street riots a few months ago when the government imposed a media blackout, said there should be no footage. A couple of the activists put a drone in the air with a camera and streamed back the footage. So who's in charge now? Anybody with two or three hundred euros to buy a camera? So another of the Big trends is the amount of data we're getting from customers, knowing where they are, what they're doing, what they've been looking for, previous relationships with them. And if you're not using this, collecting it, understanding it, then you're kind of trying to kill your business. Um, sometimes it's a bit spooky. This was a litter bin that was active in London. We still have the bins, but last year, the City of London Corporation that licenses them realized that they were collecting data about people's individual mobile phones that were going past, storing the MAC numbers of the phones, knowing quite a lot about you, actually. You know, what phone, what operating system. They could, I think, identify um, where you'd previously been and so on. Um, and that was seen as, oh, this is going to be a privacy concern. But in fact, everybody is doing this already. Um, retailers, your phone company, the government are probably selling anonymized versions of your data, which data brokers can easily de-anonymize. In the UK, the health service has been starting to sell patient data with identification details removed. Marketers can very easily take that data and relink it to individuals. You just need a couple of variables that collate with another database. Um, so there are, you know, ethical questions here, but there's also business opportunities. What happens online with tracking people in with cookies is now starting to happen offline, increasingly in the retail environment, for instance. So this is a company called Shop Perception that's using cameras to monitor how customers are behaving in the physical space to try and help you optimize where you put things on the shelf. Is he picking up this item? Is it a conversion? Is he buying it? So this is another company, QVD, that's monitoring people. Again, it says anonymously, using face recognition or tracking faces. You know, whether we're comfortable or not, this is how people are going to optimize their revenue. When you're recruiting for staff, Increasingly, it's likely that they will be given a game to play. This is a game called Wasabi Waiter by a company called Knack. It measures people's behavior in the game, and it gives a score afterwards to the recruiter. Are they cooperative? Do they make executive decisions? Do they make um, quick, logical decisions? So, you know, data is power. Monsanto last year spent almost a billion dollars on this company that monitors climate data. Because once you understand it at a very deep level, you can sell 
the service. You can help farmers who make very big financial decisions. McLaren, the Formula One company, in a typical race weekend, will collect three or four billion data points from the driver, from the car, sensors everywhere, and they find a way to visualize it and decide in real time whether to pull the car in for new tires, to adjust the steering wheel, and so on. Um, data is power. And it kind of moves towards Minority Report. This, 12 years ago, this was science fiction. Tom Cruise walking through the shopping mall, it recognizes him, it targets him with personal offers. It's now like a documentary. You know, this is no longer surprising. And then companies like this one, which is probably Britain's least loved company at the moment, um, but it's quite a clever data analytics company. So Wonga does short-term loans at very high interest rates, four or five thousand percent annual rate. Um, but it works out in real time when you apply. If you are the sort of person who is likely to repay the loan, it takes lots and lots of data points in a split second or a fifth of a second. Um, how fast you answer the question, are you currently employed? That's an indicator. Um, what color car you have, it spots correlations. I think there's a lot more power in the data, and not necessarily data that tells you something that you think it's telling you, but just by matching things and spotting patterns um, than a lot of businesses realize. And then, you know, back to Andreessen. Talk about making a loan, okay? Now, in the old days, which we're still in, somebody will have a conversation with a client and try and estimate whether they're going to be a good person to lend money to. That's just crazy to software people. How would you understand somebody's character just by having known their family or just by eye to eye? The data will tell you. Um, he talks about PayPal. It can do a real-time credit score in milliseconds just based on what you've bought on email on eBay before. And that's better than the official regulated credit store scores. It's just pattern analysis. Um, so there's interesting companies like this one, Trust I've came out of Ireland, is now big in the States, which has calculated that in a typical year, merchants will sacrifice $25 billion in trades because something stops somebody completing that trade. It's usually the retailer doesn't trust them enough and it wants extra checks. TrustDev uses lots of real-time data points. It pings your phone to check you are where it thinks you are. It checks your social media profile to check your friends are genuine so it's not a fake profile. And they say that in a fifth of a second, they can give a much higher estimate of whether you're a genuine purchaser and you know, helps the retailer. So with all this data, with the location awareness, artificial intelligence is going to be quite interesting in the next 10 years. Um, this is a man who runs a business in London called DeepMind. His name is Demis Hassabis. He's a former child chess prodigy. Um, and he's got 50 or 60 PhDs in artificial intelligence in a room opposite Russell Square Underground Station in London. And they haven't made a product. They haven't launched anything to the market. They're just trying to teach the machine general artificial intelligence. So to try and understand any prompt that it's given, not just language, not just vision. Um, so when I went to see Demis, he was very excited that they'd managed to teach the machine how to play Space Invaders. So they used the data input, the visual data input, to train the machine. Um, the first hour it kept getting killed, it didn't understand, and then it starts spotting patterns. An hour later it kind of knows when to hide. He said, we left it on all night, and by the morning it was the world's best ever Space Invader player. It would never get caught. Um, as I say, DeepMind has not released a product, so no revenue. Didn't stop Google buying them in January this year for £400,000. So Google, again, making a very big bet on artificial intelligence. I don't know if you've seen this. This is the trailer for the film Her, about a man who falls in love with his operating system. Um, unfortunately, she has 9,500 other boyfriends, and <laughs> it doesn't end well. Um, 
But this is an important film. This is a, a recent film, and it's explaining where the network is going, I think, as the machine starts to understand us and convince us that it is more human. Um, the network, the way that you will transact with a financial institution as a consumer or as a business, is going to transform. At the same time, everything is going to be online. There will be no offline. Tony Fidel used to work at Apple. He led the team that made the iPod. And then Steve asked him to lead the team that made the first three iPhones. And then he left to make a thermostat. Why would he leave to do a less cool job? Because he saw sensors coming down in price. You design an experience around a connected item. The internet of physical things becomes a reality. You can reset all sorts of businesses. So the Nest thermostat, which knows who's in the room, it adjusts the temperature according to preferences. It's called the learning thermostat. Um, it's one of the first products to show that you can actually build sensors into something that consumers like. That's how much Google bought his company for <coughs> earlier this year. And then everybody is now thinking, oh, we should have connected devices. So some of you are probably wearing some of these connected devices, tracking personal data. Maybe your dog is wearing them. Um, you have to start assuming that everything that can have a sensor in to collect data will. Already companies like this one are putting sensors in basketballs and sending back to your phone how good each shot was. At Wired, we did a project. If the whole neighborhood is connected, what happens? So the taxi will get directions based on your online schedule, and the sandwich shop will know you're coming close, so it will start to make your personal order, your chicken and avocado. Um, probably more important, the smartphone tells you if there's an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend ahead, <laughs> so you can cross the street. Um, and not everything that's got a sensor in is going to change the world. There's a company called Quirky, where the crowd can come up with inventions, and if they think it's good enough, they can make it. This is a sensor-packed jug for your milk called the Milkmaid, which Quirky put for sale. And the beautiful, clever thing about it is when your milk is starting to go sour, it will send messages to your iPhone. Um, so you presumably can dash out of meetings and go home to change your milk. You know, it's going to be quite significant for the economy. John Chambers of Cisco talks about it as $19 trillion. He says, actually, it's going to be up to 10 times as impactful as the browser-based internet. Gartner, which makes up numbers for a living, says there'll be 24 billion, 26 billion connected devices by the end of the decade. Um, it's hard to know, but again, just think about how it simplifies behavior. And in all this, people want their time back. They want no hassle. They want nothing in the way. Anybody who sells something doesn't want this to happen. Um, and this is the enemy. You know, it's these, please put in the really complicated password that you don't remember in a really bad user experience that we haven't actually designed because we're computer geeks and we haven't talked to designers. Um, and this is not the future. This is the way to stop clients getting transactions. This is the way to create that empty basket. Um, people who understand this are growing really quickly. This is a company out of Ireland called Stripe that has simplified the payment process, and they're being embedded in all sorts of websites, even Facebook's payment services using Stripe. Um, a Swedish company, Klarna, again, is bearing the risk for the merchant as you go to the checkout. So you, as the customer, are not delayed, and they do real-time checks to check that the risk they're bearing is a fair risk. And again, Uber is all about designed simplicity. When you set up an account, you don't even have to type in your credit card number. You just photograph it. It will do the work for you. That's how much they were valued at the last fundraising round. Um, so there's lots of experimenting about how we're going to interact with the network in a frictionless, seamless way. This is an Israeli company, Point Switch, is thinking it could be the human as the remote control. Maybe. It's like we don't want to go and find a remote control. Um, wearable computing will be big, but probably not like this. This is not the future of wearable computing. Um, 
this is probably not the future of, of wearable computing either, unless you're doing like an industrial task where you need layers of data in front of you, because um, it doesn't make you feel very human. It makes you self-conscious. Um, although this is the technology writer Robert Scoble, who when he first got his Google Glass, he was messianic. He said, I'm always going to wear this day and night. It's like changing my world. Um, if you don't want to see a grown man in the shower with his Google Glass, look away now. Um, no, I think wearable computing is more likely to be in the stuff that we'd already wear, like clothes. So this is a startup called OmSignal that puts smart sensors inside fabrics. They've just done a deal with Ralph Lauren. So you know, this gentleman it claims to recognize his heart rate, how many steps he's made today, his breathing rate. It even thinks it knows his mood. It says at the moment he is excited. <laughs> You'll have to work out why. Um, again, this is a London startup called Ease that's trying to use the Google Glass to pay the bill, the financial transaction. So the gentleman on the date <laughs> finds the QR code, nods twice. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but he gets the girl. Okay. <laughs> um, that's probably not the future. Again, it's something that enhances your identity, not detracts from it. More likely to be in the stuff we'd already wear, like, you know, if you're skiing, you would wear goggles. Why not the recon goggles that project data, how fast you're going, where you are, the weather? This is a wristband called the NIMI that collects your individual heart, heartbeat pattern, and uses that to authenticate you, the car or the computer. That is more likely to work because it saves you the hassle. And if it's secure, people, I think, will warm to that. And then a new way of interacting with the network comes along and actually gets quite interesting. So the Oculus Rift, for the first time, makes virtual reality something that's actually quite compelling, quite significant. And it's not just games that it's now starting to impact. Already, this is the Norwegian army is issuing these kind of glasses to its tank drivers so they can get extra layers of information in real time. They can see what's around the corner just while training them. So you've got virtual reality and now augmented reality, which used to be really clunky. You had to download software. There's now, this is a company in Stockholm that uses augmented reality in the phone. It knows where you are, great images. It creates games in physical space. So if you want to shoot your colleagues in the office, you know, if somebody has taken your coffee cup and you want to punish them, I'm not condoning violence. So the eighth of our 10 trends is people want things now. These devices are teaching us that everything should be available at one click. Nobody wants to stand in line. Nobody wants to wait for their check to clear. Nobody wants to wait for an answer. Nobody wants to hold on a phone line. Um, and it's quite interesting. Some of the big players are investing big. Tesco, uh, Amazon is investing in a big supermarket business, 100,000 items called Amazon Fresh. Not because it wants to be in the supermarket business, but in a bunch of American cities, it's delivering in the same day. It's building that infrastructure to get things to you the same afternoon. And if you think about it, that's the one disadvantage Amazon has with physical retailers. If you want to book now, you'll have to go to the bookstore. What if you can get things within an hour or two? eBay in some cities like New York is delivering within one hour. Just use your phone and it will deliver. Postmates is another company, you know, half an hour in some parts of New York, they will deliver things. You buy, it does the deal, it picks up from the shop. Uber again, they're trying local delivery. If they've got spare capacity on their infrastructure, they will deliver from the local supermarket to you. You can even in San Francisco get your medicine delivered by drone through this startup. Culturally, it's quite interesting. There's um, a book by the founder of Reddit, Alexis Ohanian, came out last year, and it kind of admitted that nobody has time to read books now. So it says on the back, this is a five-hour read, suitable for a New York to San Francisco flight, <laughs> which is kind of respectful for the customer, because anybody here have excess spare time? You know, medium, Evan Williams, 
blog network, underneath every headline tells you how long it's going to take to read that story. That is a three-minute read. That is a 20-minute read. So you can plan. So in this commodified internet world, where everybody is potentially your competition, I think it's service that makes a financial business stand apart. Service is all sorts of things. Service is design. So Barclays in London has 150 people in its design team. Now, why would a bank have a design team? They've got titles like this, job titles. And it's because we are all humans who get very frustrated with little details. I was in my hotel room last night, and the bathroom door kept swinging back. And I thought, you know, this is a tiny little adjustment of a hinge that they haven't made. And I now notice that, and it kind of changes how luxury you think a place is. It's a little tiny detail, so you have to go through the process as the customer. This is a UK chain that's growing very quickly. Um, they're trying to rethink the physical bank. They're online, but it's the physical branch. They open seven days. They open till the evening. They have toilets. They give food to your dog. They um, allow you for nothing to put all your loose change in the machine to get banknotes. They're trying to be an unbank. They're trying to rethink all the city rules. Again, you know, the lesson from these guys, if you can be helpful, if you can be that service layer, it builds up that loyalty. John Lewis in the UK is rocking their sales offline and online because they have a service ethos. You know, they're never knowingly undersold. And if something goes wrong, they are famous for helpfully dealing with it. You know, people will pay extra for the guidance. This is a London startup called Thread, where you don't just buy clothes. They partner you with somebody who's a stylist who you'll consult with online, and they'll tell you what actually is going to suit you. Again, that's something to build up loyalty. Um, last, but probably the most significant one, is cybercrime is here. Um, there is a toilet that you can buy for about 5,000 euros called Sartis. I'm sure many of you in Iceland have these. <laughs> it connects with an app, an Android app. It deodorizes automatically, heated lid. You can use your phone to do all sorts of things with it. There was a security consultant last August who released a report warning that the Sartis toilet is hackable. <laughs> if somebody didn't like you, they could access the network and cause your toilet to deodorize or flush all night, I don't know. <laughs> and I tell you this not because I think you need to go back as an expert in the hackable toilet, but just to make you aware that you know, once everything is on the network, especially stuff that matters like our finances, increasingly it's going to be vulnerable. You can get free software like this now. Anybody can download it, and it can make it very easy for you to hack into the network. It's software as a service is now crime as a service. Um, on Reddit, somebody who runs a botnet targeting people says, this is a new drug dealing. There's much more money to be made. The head of the NSA talks about the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Um, and you can go online, and there are ways to access the price list on foreign markets. This is the Russian market. A couple of years ago, you could hack a Gmail account for $162 or a corporate mailbox for $500 pretty good deal. Um, these guys, who became quite notorious for hacking into MasterCard, among others, um, I talked to one of their founders, well, one of their, this was the spokesman, this is Jake Davis. He was caught when he was a teenager, did a bit of time. He's now clean in London. Um, and I asked him, what kind of mindset do these people have? And he said, when they took down MasterCard, <laughs> it was just some kid doing it for fun. You know, most of them don't see even saving credit cards as ethically wrong. It's just a little game. You do it for the lulls. <laughs> Last extra bonus free trend. Because um, all this is happening, you can't keep still. You have to keep innovating. This man is Stephen Sasson. In 1975, he invented this. Who knows what this is? Any guesses? Come on. I'm not doing all the work. 
Let's ask the chairman. It's the first digital camera. Well done. It's the world's <laughs> first digital camera. Unfortunately, he worked here, <laughs> where their model was print, film. So they buried the invention. So it's quite ironic that um, two years ago when Kodak, which once had 140,000 staff, when they went into bankruptcy, another 13-person photography company was bought for a billion dollars because they realized it's not about film, it's not about pictures, it's actually about sharing, behavior changes. Um, but Kodak had the chance because there's another company called Fujifilm that was in the same position and they saw what was coming. The founder, who now I think is about 75, said, we've got to diversify and work out what our core value is. What do we add? So they realized that it was imaging technology that they understood. So they diversified into medical imaging, even into cosmetics. They understood light analysis. And even this week, Fujifilm is in the news for developing a treatment for Ebola because they started diversifying into pharmaceuticals. And they've done all right. You know, these guys, in 1999, were approached Enron Broadband Services said, we can create a streaming business. It's early, but broadband is going to come down in price. They weren't interested. They were renting VHS. Didn't work. Meanwhile, these guys come along and stream. So you've got to think ahead about what the next threats will be. Because we move quickly. We're in the exponential era, the old linear era. When you add 1 plus 1 plus 1, you get to 30. That was the last century. Now, when you're doubling at each step because of Moore's law, you get to a billion by the 30th step, and that very quickly changes the dynamics. That's the Moore's law curve that continues, that's also you know, giving us these very powerful small computers the size of an SD card. And it's affecting you know, how quickly is the price of storage going to zero. If you were in 1994, you would not conceive of a cloud storage computing industry, um, but you're on that exponential curve, and suddenly, the inflection hits you. How quickly does consumer behavior change because of a new device? It's accelerating. So I'll leave you with um, some advice from this gentleman. Keep experimenting. Keep trying new things, because it's not going to be as it was yesterday. You know, these are posters you have on the wall in Facebook. This is the mindset. Move fast and break things. Get it out there. Done is better than perfect. This is the startup mindset. Is this a technology company? Existential question. Somebody's written, no, it's a poster making company. Um, so I'll leave you with a, a quick thought experiment. It's 1983. This new gadget comes on the market with celebrity endorsers. And you're AT&T, the big American provider of landline phones, copper cable. So you're worried. Is this going to be an op a threat, or is it an opportunity we should get into? AT&T calls in McKinsey and asks McKinsey to tell them, it's 1983, by the year 2000, how many of these mobile telephones will there be in America? So McKinsey goes and does its number crunching, and it says, well, actually, we think it could be quite significant. It could be like almost a million mobile phones, <laughs> which was, you know, wasn't a bad guess. Slightly out. <laughs> um, and there's three things McKinsey got wrong. One, again, it forgot the Moore's Law that would change the form factor and make it portable. Um, two, they forgot the emotional connectivity aspect. It's not about the technology, it's about how it enhances our identity. And three, they framed their thinking in that day's norms. In 1983, the norm, if you wanted to make a phone call, was to go to the call box, to go to the office, to go home. Um, the norm today, just ask any 16-year-old, is wherever you are, you should get whatever you want. So I'm going to leave you with my own personal dilemma. I'm in magazine business, shiny magazine. We make apps, but still wired as a magazine. What happens when the next generation grows up? <laughs> you can't pinch and zoom a paper magazine. <laughs> you can't swipe them. <laughs> and, you know... It's a real question. You know, what is her expectation going to be when she's 18? You know, will every store have to have a swipeable wall? <laughs> Thank you.